Thank you. Uh, thank you for an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, but nobody so far seems to have mentioned anything about public transport. Um, I was in, very impressed with Professor Kissling's address to a meeting uh, at the netball courts a couple of weeks ago where he said we should be scrapping the central bus depot, we should be having, and having a, a bus ring and then uh, minibuses into the centre. Have you any comments on that? I think, I think you'll, you'll understand from what I was saying that if, if the city does develop a series of villages, which it will, eight or nine villages, and downtown Christchurch being its own unique multi, m big mega village, if you like, um, that has to be well connected and it predisposes itself to an orb web spider type connection and I think it needs to be well connected from a broadband capability, uh, from a wireless capability and already you're seeing the mobile phone companies popping new towers up around the city to reflect this nodal activity and from a, a transport uh, uh, perspective and it's not only public transport, it's uh, cars as well. How, how, we, how we redesign all of that and I'm not sure what if you're dreaming 10, 20 years out what our public transport system looks like, I'm pretty sure it won't be diesel buses. Um, and I'm pretty sure that we, we might find that there are other good transport solutions that are public transport that aren't big lumbering buses working their way around the city. And it may be a combination of much smaller vehicles or light, light rail or something like that. But I'm open to all sorts of suggestions there. I think public transport is essential. Um, and the other thing, of course, is as the previous speaker said, we need to integrate cycleways in that we are, because we're largely a flat city, we are, have got a huge head start with regard to cycles. And we used to be, didn't we? There used to be cycles all over the place uh, before we ran all our kids to school. Um, and uh, so we need to get back into that space. So opportunity again to integrate the whole thing, take a long term view on, on pedestrian cycle, public transport and, and private transport. All right, we'll take one more up the back. Yes. Either or either. Yep. Um, could I just ask a question? You made some interesting comments in terms of um, primary health care and, and the, the health system, and we've got the, the hospital, which is going through um, you know, a, 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 a phase of rebuilding and so on. Could you make some more comments in terms of how you see the health service sort of integrating into a city centre? Yes, certainly. Um, I mean, this, I'm on the board of Pegasus Health, so I declare that conflict, uh, which looks after 320 GPs in the city. Um, but the way I see it is that there's an inevitable trend from secondary care, which is keeping people in hospital, to primary care, which is keeping people in the community. And that's inevitable because it's too expensive, frankly, to keep people in hospital. And hospital is actually quite a dangerous place to be when you're sick. Um, it, it is. Um, and, and so we need to make sure that we've got people as much as, as we can being dealt to in primary care facilities in the community. Now, that, that's about general practice. It's about integrated health care facilities. And it's also about training people for that future. I mean, we have a, a very um, low number of, of people training to work in the primary sector, and we need to improve that. So the, what my dream with the health sector is that you would have your hospital, and then you should tend onto that a research facility, like the Canterbury Medical Research Foundation, which is there now, medical school, which is there now, but face the students more to the primary sector than the secondary sector. You know, why should we train doctors and hospitals when their future is to work in the community? And, and then set up various centres of medical excellence that subtend into the central city so that we have a, a New Zealand-wide and world-recognised medical cluster that involves teaching, it involves health services, it involves research, and it involves uh, uh, industries building up around the health sector. We've got some really good ones here in Christchurch now, um, but I can see that as a real possibility. We have an annual budget here in Christchurch in Canterbury of $1.2 billion that the government pours into health. If we can find a smarter way to deliver value on that 1.2 million by taking advantage of the opportunity that has been delivered to us through this earthquake, then that's got to be a good thing. All right, uh, there was a question over here, I think. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, yeah, this is about uh, keeping the road network in the CBD, central city the same. Uh, hasn't that, the CIRA has given the Alliance, the City Council and uh, people like Alden Hogan and so forth, 120 days to come up with their plan. Now, that seems to me, and I've had a bit of experience with sort of projects and designs, so seems to be incredibly short, unless you're going to just go for rebuilding what was, rather than doing what 
we all feel we ought to do, which is go for radical change. Yes, I think you're right. I mean, the council have been given a, a total of, of nine months to present a plan for the CBD. Part of that, you can see it on the notice board out here, actually, the time frame. And um, part of that is, is, uh, is going to be to ensure that we do have a future focus for our city. Um, and if, it's, if, it isn't, if, it, if the time frames don't allow it to be radical enough, then my response to that would be that there are going to be precincts in the central city that are going to be relatively easy to redevelop. And there are going to be bits of the central city that are going to be much harder. If in the context of a city plan we need to take more time, then let's get the easy bits sorted quickly in the context of a bigger long-term plan that will be more complicated and more radical, and that, and, but predispose ourselves to be doing that over time. All right, uh, we'll go to the wings. If we get a chance, we'll come back here. I think there was a couple over here, wasn't there? Yes, you too. Yep, keep going. Straight ahead, yep. Ah. <laughs> Peter, you talk about losing human capital. I'll be a little bit radical to suggest that if you're a professionally trained person who's lived in Christchurch and have employment, you've done very well. We have a large number of highly qualified Cantabrians who are in many cases are underemployed, unemployed, and, what, and I, for one, and I know many have been trying to win positions, we don't even get looked at. How can we start before we, even the tradespeople, why pour money into training people when we've already got no idea of the level of skill and expertise that is under or unemployed in Christchurch? Thank you for that. Um, very good question. Uh, that's, that's why we need an iconic city, not an ordinary city, because an iconic city will create the sorts of opportunities that you need. We should be in a situation right now where we are better informed about our future labour force requirements than ever because we know what we've got ahead of us. We know that we've got to rebuild. We know we're going to be the construction capital of New Zealand for the next 10 years. We know that. It is certain. And we know that we've got everything around that that requires to be supported as we rebuild the city. So I think you'll find Sarah, the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority, putting a lot of emphasis on skill needs, skill requirements and recruitment. And the one thing I would say is that never, ever, ever underestimate the local resource capacity we have right here to rebuild the city. We don't need a zillion people coming in from the outside to rebuild our city. We can rebuild it ourselves and we can do it with people like you that can be really actively employed in the rebuild. It really worries me that some people think the, the answer to rebuilding Christchurch is external. It isn't external, it is here. Peter, um, I'm, I'm a property owner, I've got about 30 properties, um, four in the CBD, uh, two red stick and two yellow. And um, I'm actually pretty horrified what you said earlier about you know, the confiscation and uh, pretty much and, uh, and the autocratic uh, type things and your radical ideas. Um, the one thing, I mean, the big problem is, and I know there's a lot of other property owners, uh, we don't ha we've had no communication from, the, from, from anyone. I mean, the first communication we got was someone wanted to bulldoze one of our red sticker buildings uh, on a Sunday morning about four weeks after the earthquake. Um, fortunately, we got that put off. Uh, but, I mean, we consider it fixable. Um, we hadn't had a chance to even be inside it uh, since the earthquake at that stage. I mean, why has there been no... Uh, direct communication with property owners in CBD to get things moving. You could get blocks sorted out weeks ago. Um, uh, the blocks we're in are now outside uh, the cordon, uh, but uh, they could have been opened up a week after there, in, in the Barbados Street area. There was no reason for it to be delayed this long. Okay. Can I just, I'll, I'll just answer that quickly because I sure. suspect we're running out of time. Um, first of all, let me just make one thing very clear. I didn't talk about autocratic imposition of stealing your property rights. I said that if Sarah's legislation had to be invoked, we would have failed. You as a property owner, in my opinion, have a responsibility to work together with co-property owners in your precinct to work out a holistic and strategic solution to your area of the city. If you can't do that, then maybe someone has to step in and say, well, how does this all end up? The second thing about access is no, absolutely no control of mine. I have no influence over that at all, although I must say that the Recover Canterbury Group, the joint venture of the Canterbury Employees Chamber of Commerce and the uh, Canterbury Development Corporation were instrumental in getting as many businesses as we could into the city and, and pushing the boundaries with civil defence to make sure that where it was safe we got businesses in and we got literally thousands of businesses into the city. 
Um, but that was, that was driven primarily initially by uh, saving lives, then recovering those that couldn't be saved, then safety. And, and I remember quite well the controller of, of civil defence, John Hamilton, saying to me, he said, I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't. If I refuse to let businesses into the city, um, they accuse me of, of being anti-business, and if I let them in and someone gets killed by a falling brick, I'll be damned anyway. So I'm damned both ways. So I understand that you can work away at the margins, and we will do whatever we can as a Chamber of Commerce to make sure that happens. But I saw only yesterday um, more photographs of the central city, and the reason, one of the reasons why the press headline this morning was talking about insisting on demolition is that the central city is still an extraordinarily dangerous place, and we just need to recognise that. All right. Sorry, I'm going to have to move on to I'm sorry. Um, on that note, um, an outstanding presentation. Please, uh, your applause for Peter Townsend. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.